Welcome to today's program, Sales Pipeline Best Practices, with our special guest, Bill Kaidish from Pitney Bowes. I first wanted to thank the many people who worked on today's webinar, especially Bill and our team at InsideSales.com, and for Chandra Patel, who's hosting the live Q&A after the recorded Q&A. Today is an exciting day for Inside Sales, as it's our official EMEA launch, uh, which is why our US-based team is running today's webinar, um, and our UK team is making preparations for our launch party tonight. During the recording of this uh, webinar, C9 had not transitioned all of its products to the Inside Sales platform. So while the functionality of any mention of the product is the same, as you engage with us in the future, some products may have different names. This webinar should last about an hour. If you have any audio or slide issues, please refresh your browser. The sound for today's webinar is VoIP, so the audio will come through your computer speakers or headphones. If you're hoping to call in via phone, I apologize, but we promise to send you the link to today's recording. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm excited to introduce Bill, who is the Director of Global Sales Analytics and Opportunity Management um, in the Global Sales Operations at Pitney Bowes. He's celebrating almost 16 years with Pitney Bowes. His background is in marketing and sales. And prior to coming to Pitney Bowes, he worked at General Electric. While at Pitney Bowes, he has managed marketing program development, execution for their mailing business, inside sales, partnership development, process management, and the global salesforce.com implementation. Let's turn it over to Bill to hear what he is currently working on at Pitney Bowes. It's a, it's a global sales operations organization. We've never had that before formally uh, within our company. We've had it in different pockets, but now we have a global sales operations organization. And what I'm doing is uh, my team manages what we call our sales management system center of excellence, or COE. And the COE is really comprised of three different groups. And the first group is or team is our salesforce.com implementation and management team, and they're really focused on sales and marketing processes. Um, it's important to note that when we implemented salesforce.com at, at Pitney Bowes, um, we took multiple instances and brought them into one single instance about three years ago, and that's important for today's conversation to understand that because it also helps us understand and realize how we manage uh, opportunity management and pipeline management within that. The second team we have is business support and governance, and this team is really focused on managing all of our application and data cases as it relates to C9 and Salesforce, and really they are eyes and ears to our user community. And they really help manage and provide input to our enhancement and release process that we go through um, on a, you know, almost like a, a bi-monthly basis. And the third team, which is really focused on what we're going to talk about today, is our insights and performance team. And the, this team is really a, a group of analytical professionals. They're focused on the headlights of the business. So most of us are used to looking at the rearview mirror, right? So what did we do before instead of looking out forward and saying, how much coverage do we have in our pipeline? What does our business really look like? What does the health really look like? So this team really uncovers that and leverages C9 to do a lot of that. So these three teams really complement each other and help us monitor and manage the business more effectively uh, for Pitney Bowes. So we've been working together now, C9 and Pitney Bowes, for a little over a year. And Bill, it was really, in my mind, the perfect marriage of process and technology. I know that when we first started our conversations, you guys were thinking seriously about some of the top line objectives that you wanted to achieve from a growth perspective, how you wanted to manage the pipeline to achieve that growth, and we were able to meet you with a solution uh, to, to operationalize and, and provide instrumentation around some of the strategies that you were putting in place. Just to give a broad level overview of C9 and our solutions. We're a predictive sales company, and what that means is that we use data science to drive predictive insights through some key applications that C9 
sales organizations would use to manage their business. C9 Pipeline helps reps to score deals and identify the next best action that will allow them to close the deal. Our forecasting application drives a regular cadence around forecasting, but then helps organizations to get a, an additional perspective using machine learning. And then Sales Advisor is an application that can be used by reps. Today we're going to focus though on C9 Pipeline. That's the application bill that you and, and Pitney rolled out. And before we get into the specifics of the solution that you built and the underlying process, it would be great if maybe you could take a few minutes just to give a broad brush overview of some of the challenges that you were facing about a year ago. Sure. Um, you know, as any company, we experience a lot of business challenges in, in all sorts of areas. And really our business challenges were, and to really some extent still, are inconsistent business practices across business units and even within regions of business units. And I you know, one of the reasons I say that we still have pockets of in inconsistent practices is that it takes a while to affect change and embed this into your culture. And really, uh, you know, some people change faster than others, depending on where they are in, in the globe, how they're managed. And one of the things we really found is we didn't have a common language around pipeline management. Everybody had their own definition and, and their own process as well. And the cadence of deal reviews varied dramatically across all of our business. Today, you know, I could take five people, I could grab five salespeople off the street and get five different answers about pipeline management or the cadence of a deal review. And what happened with this is this created pretty much three blind spots in our business. And, you know, the first one was really lack of pipeline transparency. We didn't really understand the health of our pipeline at, at all. And anecdotal insurances. What ended up happening was, you know, you'd have a rep telling me, yeah, I've got all the right contacts, we're working with the right people, the opportunity is going to close on time, I've identified the power sponsor. So we didn't, we weren't dealing with facts, we we're just dealing with, you know, what people were telling us without being able to look kind of in the crystal ball and say what was going on. And the other piece of it was no long-range visibility of our future pipeline. Everything was either a 30-day sprint or a 90-day sprint. So a little, a little over a year ago, you know, as Justin was saying, how we've uh, gotten together just over a year now, that uh, we had a sales leader come up to us and ask us about the, the sales cycle length, right, in his business unit. He said, my reps are telling me it's about a year. He goes, but I don't know if it's fact or fiction. And you can imagine this was just one of the many challenges we were wrestling with prior to implementing C9. With, the, with not having transparency in the pipeline, and we were really unable to discern the truth from anecdote throughout the sales cycle. Since we didn't have long-range visibility, uh, you know, in, even more importantly, the coverage that was needed, even if you could see your opportunities, you know, did you have enough opportunities? And reps were focusing on closing those opportunities immediately instead of working on developing more long-term pipelines. So what ended up happening is we have this feast or famine cycle of revenue prediction. So this is really where we started seeing reps sprinting the closed deals that they have at the, at, the, uh, at the moment. It's really kind of this close, close, close mentality. And what you don't see is opportunity creation. And with some business units having very long sales cycles, it became a very dangerous pattern because the business becomes really lumpy and unpredictable, especially if you have some whales uh, in your business where you have very large opportunities that can either make you or break you, and, and that's what you really got to think about smoothing out. So for those of you who have ever run a pipeline review or even may have participated in a review, you may notice that what will happen is they'll sit there and they'll export everything out of their CRM system. So everybody loves the Excel spreadsheet. So you invest in this CRM system, you invest in C9, and all of a sudden people start pulling things out of, uh, out of those systems and putting them into spreadsheets, which is you know, really concerning. And they start creating columns and creating notes and everything else. So as they sit down and have their discussion weekly, you hope, on a deal review, all of a sudden the person who's taking the notes starts overwriting what was said the previous week. 
So the rep said, I, I'm going to meet with the CFO and I'm going to close the deal. I just need a signature. The next week he says, well, I got to go talk to somebody else. So you start losing track of the history of everything. So what we started realizing that we started experimenting with different reports and dashboards in our CRM system, but it really didn't provide us with a robust view that we needed. And that's really the time that we decided we needed help from C9 and uh, started to create what we called our four cornerstone metrics, which we'll uh, soon talk about. That's a great segue, Bill. I, I love the fact that major changes can be catalyzed by simple questions. You mentioned an executive came to you and asked how long the average sales cycle was. It seems like an interesting or an easy question to answer, and yet anyone that's been in the business knows that it's a, it's a complicated question. What I love is based on that question and a few others, you decided to build an entire program around more efficient pipeline management. And I've been intrigued by the thoroughness of the, the program that's come together and the kind of results it's been able to drive. Maybe if you could take a few minutes just to share the secret sauce here at a high level of how you run a pipeline management call, we can then start to delve into some of the specific aspects of it after. Sure. So when we look at uh, you know these four what we call cornerstone metrics, our philosophy was very simple as to take these business challenges and really focus on, and more importantly, institutionalize the four metrics that everybody was using, literally from the sales rep that was on the street to our CEO. Uh, each one of these metrics really provide us different perspectives on how well a rep or a region are tracking to their plan. And I'm going to talk a lot about tracking the plan, right? So if my plan's 100, am I at 90% of 100, or am I 110% of 100? And you really want to understand where they are in that plan. And leveraging C9 to expose these dimensions of pipeline health uh, really helped us because this is, these are just things that we absolutely never had before. The first is really pipeline analysis. Understanding, do I have enough pipeline this quarter as well as next quarter to make plans? Because it's just in, as important to look at the next quarter due to specifically our long sales cycles. And depending on your business, uh, you, know, you may want to do the same. Or even if you have very, very, very long sales cycles that could last up to two years, you'd want to look at several quarters out. But it's different, you know, it's very difficult to create and close pipeline for the next quarter when your sales cycle extends beyond next quarter's time frame. So in order to create a new opportunity and close it when you have very long sales cycles, it's almost impossible to do at times unless you can pull in opportunities from future quarters. The other piece is really to investigate change. What has changed on a week-to-week -week basis? What has moved in? What has moved out? And where did it go? And, and we're going to focus a little bit more as we get into each one of these on the where did it go, because that's the big question that everybody starts to ask. The third component or metric we use is, is pipeline risk. And really, what percentage of our pipeline is at risk, and where is it coming from? Because there are so many different areas that risk can come from push deals, stale deals, deals that have gone by. So we look at that very closely. And then uh, stage progression. Are my opportunities moving through the sales stages at a pace that allow them to close on time? And then what do I need to do to focus on the different components of progression in the quarter? So what happens is the value of these metrics provide us with you know, a, a good ability to, to look deeper at any pipeline and ask the right questions. And it's all about asking the right questions because most pipeline reviews will say, okay, you look, you look good, you're at 100%, just move on, instead of deep looking at some of these dimensions that C9 has been able to provide us. Um, so we have implemented these four very simple metrics to help us manage the business. And people often ask us, really, how do we use the information and how do we use it within our organization? So really simply, at a rep level, we want it to be used at least weekly. And at the manager level, we really want to have them look at it on a daily basis because they're managing multiple people. And it's also dependent on the, on the team, because if I'm running an inside sales or a telemarketing channel, you should be looking at a daily basis, 
because you, it's moving very quick. You have lots of transactions. You know, you have thousands, tens of thousands of transactions compared to handfuls or hundreds in your potentially field sales channel. At, uh, at our executive level, every two weeks, our business unit leaders, from our CFO to CEO, um, they go over all of the pipeline and what's happening in the businesses. They look at specifically the overall business and they look at region, both uh, this quarter and next quarter because they want to make sure that we are locking up and ensuring we have enough um, pipeline for the out, out quarters. And if they're not tracking the plan, we have a whole concept of building a road, really a roadmap to plan and how they will get back on course. And we want to have a discussion about the root cause of why there is a deficiency in the plan. And that's very important to note because you know, it, it's really not a punitive exercise. It's really about understanding what's going on in the pipeline. Do we have issues with the uh, training? Do we have competitive threats? Do we have product issues or what's happening inside of there? And one of the things that we learned very early on, and this whole process is a journey and doesn't happen overnight. Once we put the technology in place, it's really about developing a consistent cadence for pipeline review and educating people on an ongoing basis and con you know, really continuing to reinforce the behavior you want. It's not an event. And if anybody thinks it's an event, um, they, are, they are solely mistaken because Anytime you treat something like this as an event, people won't use it, won't remember it, won't know how to manage it, and then it'll become very inconsistent. And your frontline sales manager, uh, in my opinion, is absolutely the most critical link in, link in your entire sales execution process. Bill, what's interesting about the process you've laid out here, I think you've been able to take a lot of the subjectivity that's inherent in pipeline management out of the equation and bring in some hard data, and it's interesting the way that that's helped you to drive strategy and make decisions that you might not otherwise make. Pipeline analysis, I think, is a great example. You guys have a very uh, sophisticated approach, I would say, analytical approach to understanding where you're going to land a quarter. I'd love if maybe you could spend a couple minutes talking about how you're analyzing the pipeline and, more importantly, how you determine maybe three months out where you're going to land the quarter. Sure. Um, yeah, a large portion of our pipe is uh, really trying to get a clear understanding of the channels to understand if they have developed enough pipeline both this, this quarter and next quarter in order to meet their plan. And it, it, it has become so simple for us right now. We can look at the pipeline, you know, any day, any month, any quarter, and based on some simple calculations and historical performance, we can predict future outcome. And it's, it, this has really helped us move, kind of move the needle of Pitney Bowes. And we, we want to make sure we understand exactly how each one of our businesses is tracking the plan. With some of our business units, uh, they have sales cycles six months or in, even, you know, into the 18-month range, depending on uh, the, the type of product that they're selling. And we really need to understand the headlights to the business and understand that those outlying quarters, as we kind of talked about, as many of you know, we focus on, as you know, typically that 90-day sprint, right? There's almost four year-end closings in a year. How do I get to the end of 90 days, and then I'm going to worry about creating opportunities later? What this has done for us is we can tell really early on, uh, based on a business unit's pipeline, the health of the pipeline, the makeup of the pipeline, the number of opportunities that they have, and the quality, and we also start to understand how they are going to really kind of really perform in the future. And then by understanding that, we can, again, start creating that roadmap in order to bridge the gap to get them back to plan. Also part of the roadmap is to understand, as we talked about before, is really the root cause and of the pipe and where it should be. And that's, that's very important. It's, it's kind of it's something new that we've introduced to the, to the whole company, the reps, over the past year because, it, you know, you get the, uh, you know, I, I'll make it, but now what we're, we're trying to do is talk about, well, let's talk about the actual steps that you're going to take to make it. And then 
in combination with this, the yield piece, uh, what we look at yield and pipeline analysis, is we look at our total opening pipeline. So if you imagine, let's look at the big first, first day of the quarter and say what's the opening pipeline look like, and then we look at what's the closing pipeline look like, or excuse me, the closing, what do we win, right, at the end of the quarter? So I look at what do we win over my opening pipeline, we call that yield. It's not necessarily a win rate for us. What it is is something that we say is I'm going to start with 100 things in the beginning of the pipeline, and what is it going to fundamentally yield at the end? I'm going to have things go out. I'm going to have things come in. I'm going to lose things. I'm going to win things. I'm going to push things. So we start to look at that pipeline yield, and we also look at, um, you know, how – how that compares to the current pipeline. So if I've got a 30% yield, you think you're going to have about a three and a half time pipeline in order to uh, achieve plan by the end of that quarter. And then um, one of the things that we started realizing when we started looking at uh, some of our yields is we started seeing that all of a sudden, some reps had yields beyond 100%. And you sit there and you scratch your head and you go, how is that even possible to have a yield that would be beyond, you know, uh, 50%? So what was happening is we started seeing reps putting in, uh, they'd have an opening pipeline of 100, and they'd have a, I, they won $150 at the end of the quarter. So you'd say, well, that's a 150% yield. And that's not right. So what we we started doing is looking at that a little more closely, and we engaged a lot of our, our sales management people as well as our learning development people to start working with the sales reps and making sure that they're putting the opportunities at the right time and not just dropping the opportunities into the pipeline in the middle of the quarter and closing them at the same time. So you're able to drive a yield analysis not just at the macro level, but literally come down to the rep level and understand on an individual basis what the yields were, the historic yields, and then compare that to the rep's pipeline. Yeah, we, 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 can, we look at yield from the rep to the manager to the team to the country to the region to the business unit level, and each one has their own specific yield because everybody performs a little differently. Yep, makes total sense. So this is a visualization of what the way one might visualize a yield analysis. What's interesting about this chart, it's got a few different layers to it that you're not going to typically see. Just about every organization has the yellow line, which is every organization has the yellow line, which is your quota. The underlying orange dotted line represents what your sales team has committed. But then based on the kind of analysis Bill just described, you can actually create the green line. That's the projected yield analysis. And the way that that's calculated is by looking at your historical yield and comparing it to your current pipeline. It's a, it's a notion that's familiar to most sales teams. The challenge, though, is operationalizing it, getting it down to the sales rep level, and then in real time delivering projections off of that. There's a lot of data that sits behind it and then a lot of analysis. One of the things we tried to do at C9 is actually take this yield analysis to the next level. Historically, one of the challenges with the yield analysis has been if you simply take your current pipeline and apply historic ratios to it, the assumption you're making is that the quality of today's pipeline matches that of last quarter's pipeline such that you are going to have a similar yield. But in many cases, the pipeline, the, the profile of the pipeline may change, the deals may change. And so what customers have asked us about is, is there a way to get a sense for the quality of the current pipeline and how it compares? So you'll see that we've also got an orange set of orange bars there. That represents the degree or the amount of risk in your current pipeline. We're able to measure that by analyzing individual deals using data science to assess how risky they are and the probability that they'll actually close. And then if they don't exceed a certain threshold, we can flag them as high risk opportunities. And in that way, we're able to compare the riskiness of the pipeline this quarter to last quarter. The net net is you get a very rich view now of what your pipeline looks like. You've still got the commit that's coming from your sales team. Very important to get their perspective, obviously, because they're on the front line. But in addition to that, you've got analysis based on yield. You've got an analysis based on the risk of the pipeline, 
and you can then drive real projections off of it. And it's these three different cuts of the forecast now that give executives and managers a much more confident view of how the business is going to trend. So it makes sense, Bill, that you start with the, uh, the pipeline analysis is the first part of the cadence that you're running to manage the pipeline. Talk a little bit about now what it means to investigate change in your pipeline. Sure. So I think all of us what can see, you know, can can appreciate this next statement. So it's, you know, how many times a, a sales leader walked up to you and said, "We had enough pipeline to more than make our quarter. What happened the last few days of the month?" So, uh, you know, it's it happened to us constantly before we engaged C9, and everybody would stand around and just shrug their shoulders and go, "I have no idea." And with the advent of C9, it has really been able to help us really investigate change and where has the pipeline gone. And there's really two sides to that equation. It's what's changed week over week, and it's kind of like a debits and credits type of uh, you know, accounting, right? So it's what has moved into the pipeline and what has moved out. And we get our folks to focus on a, you know, a number of movements, and we, but we, there's a lot we can look at with Investigate Change, and Justin will kind of show us in, in the next slide, but what happens is we focus on a few of them, right? We don't want to overwhelm people. So we look at our overall won versus lost opportunities. Am I winning more than I'm losing? What's happening there? Am I, do I have slip deals or push deals from one quarter to the next? And this really, this piece creates a tremendous amount of frustration. And you start to ask yourself, was the opportunity really properly managed in the first place so it would close on time and not slip? The other piece, and this is, something that we've recently started to uncover was uh, bluebirds. These are, these are opportunities that were just never in the pipeline to begin with, and we didn't have any visibility to them. So as I talked about yield before, I'm looking at my opening pipeline and then what closed at the end of the quarter. These bluebirds don't even come into play, really, uh, with, with that, except for the closed factor, because they will be closing that, that quarter, but they're not part of that opening pipeline. So it even impacts the way we measure our business. So most of these bluebirds really, you know, if I've got a six month, nine month, 12 month sales cycle and all of a sudden I've got a $50,000 deal that drops into a quarter, well, you know, I, I don't think that that just fell into a sales rep's lap and I don't think the sales rep is that good to do that. <laughs> so if anybody has sales reps that are like that, you know, fantastic. Um, really, this view this about investigating change really helps the manager and rep have more meaningful conversations about the opportunities. And really, it becomes at a glance that they can see how everything is tra trending, and it's helping us focus with continued development of pipe rather than just closing what they have and then worry about creating opportunities later. It's really about balance. And people need to create and close enough opportunities in order to achieve plan. And one of the things that we've really unearthed, um, we noticed that one of our business units spent the first six months creating opportunities, working opportunities, but then the second six months, they didn't create any new opportunities. They spent all their time closing the first six months opportunities that they created. So this really, this view allows us to monitor the business and we can leverage the right people in order to help us change these behaviors, which could be caused by the way the manager is managing the cadence of the review process or, uh, you know, a, a whole myriad of uh, different uh, factors. Yeah, you know, Bill, it's funny. I think regardless of the kind of organization you run, what industry you're in, what geo you cover, the first question on the pipeline call is, what changed since we talked since we talked last, and that still continues to be the hardest question to answer. You think about how dynamic organizations are, moving people around, combining territories, or even if the territories are stable, trying to keep track of changes in closed dates, what moved in, what moved out, and to date there really hasn't been a great solution for that. I think that's that's an area where um, a lot of customers find value in working with C9. Let me give you a quick visual of uh, how we would answer the question, what changed. 
far left, you've got your pipeline at the beginning of a specific period. Far right, you've got your pipeline at the end of a specific period. But then we'll itemize, in terms of a waterfall chart, all of the puts and takes associated with those movements, what came in, what came out, uh, what you lost. If you only had the beginning and the end point, you might not realize all of the nuances associated with the transitions in your pipeline. And that's the color that really gives a manager information they need to, to drive the pipeline. All right, Bill, so we've got a few minutes left, and then we'll head over to our questions. I see a few questions coming in right now, actually. But I did want to get to the second or the third and the fourth steps in your pipeline management process briefly. Um, talk to us a little bit about pipeline risk analysis. We've already had a couple questions come in about what constitutes risk in the pipeline, and we'd love some more color there. Sure. Well, I'll hit some highlights so we can take some of the questions. But the, the risk analysis is really probably absolutely one of my most favorite parts of what C9 has to offer because it really starts to separate fact from fiction. If you have reps that are tracking at 100% of plan, right, what ends up happening is the manager kind of walks away and says, I don't have to worry about Nancy. Nancy's doing a great job. She's 100%, 110%. Don't have to think about it. That was kind of the old world. Today's world, we start looking at it and go, wait a minute. Part of that pipeline is at risk. You could look at 30% risk that someone is tracking the plan at 100%. You go, you're really at 70%. We've got to understand what's going on. And some of the things that we start to really look at is uh, how many times a deal is pushed. That That is probably the biggest risk factor that we see because we measure push in terms of how many times does the estimated close date change from quarter to quarter, not within quarter. So if something pushed four times, that means it's happened four quarters in a row. And you have a very frank conversation and say, why do you think it's going to close this quarter? You told me it's going to close last quarter, the quarter before, the quarter before that. So that's one of the things that are, we're very, very focused on. And how long has uh, opportunity has been in a given stage? And also um, activity against that opportunity. How many times has that opportunity been touched? Not moving stage around, but really am I putting tasks against those opportunities, events against the opportunities? Am I updating information, contacts, et cetera? So those are the in-between stage activities that we uh, really look at. And, and the one last thing, which is I, I call the absolute sin, is when opportunities have closed dates in the past and they've already gone by, and you've done all that work, and you've let it go by you. So. Yep. so this is an interesting view of the pipeline. On the top, you've got, on a deal-by-deal -deal basis, some key risk metrics associated with the deals, so how you can figure out which deals are stalled, where the reps aren't cultivating the deals in the form of a frequent touch pattern. Below, you've got a profile of each of the different reps to be able to zoom in on some of the weaknesses that the reps exhibit. Across all of their deals, you may have some reps that are demonstrating that they continue to push the deals. And you realize now that maybe they need some help in qualifying the closed process associated with that. What's interesting about this, it's a set of predefined metrics that an organization has determined are important to track. And then they can be, on a regular basis, trended and used to manage on the pipeline call. Where it gets really interesting is when you introduce the notion of data science. Using data science, you can look at individual deals, but rather than tracking four or five discrete risk metrics, data science will actually identify the unique factors that are representing risk for that particular deal. The way that that works is they'll pull the data, the algorithms will literally pull in thousands of attributes associated with the account, associated with the opportunity, and based on that, flag the specific metrics that aren't tracking based on historical patterns. In one opportunity, your biggest risk might be that you're not pricing correctly. In another one, maybe you're not bridging with an executive. It's hard to lay out a static dashboard that captures the unique nuances of each deal, but once you introduce data science, you can proactively and dynamically surface those. So there's some really exciting technologies out there, and it's really taken the art of pipeline management to the, new, to the next level. All right, Bill, so we're on the last step now, which is the 
uh, stage progression step. Maybe tell us a, a little bit about how that enters into your process. Sure. So the, the progression stage is really where we're looking at how each one of our uh, sales stages are progressing through the sales cycle and how much time they're spending there. And when we do our, our analysis, progression really doesn't come into it, I would say, very early on in the quarter. It comes in later in the quarter. We start looking at it probably about the fourth week because the first few weeks we're focused on do I have enough pipeline to cover plans, and then we start looking at what's the risk of that, what's changed, and then later on we start looking at progression. So as we're going to start getting towards the end of the quarter, am I moving those early stage opportunities to the later stages in order to make sure that they're going to close? Because if you think about these dimensions we've talked about, about change and risk and everything else, now we've got to make sure if it doesn't have risk associated with it and we've got enough to cover plans, Am I progressing it quickly enough through the sales cycle in order to achieve it? And uh, really, one of the things we uncovered early on in our progression analysis is one would think that the sales process that you've laid out for your company and our company is a linear process. You go from stage X to stage Z. And what we discovered was sales reps are jumping all over the place with the sales progression, stage progression. You'll see people going in, putting it in stage two, it'll sit, 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 closed one. They'll go two, three, closed one. And we've seen all kinds of, of different uh, scenarios here. And it really makes you stop and think about, am I, is my sales process aligned with the customer buying process? And is it an overtaxing sales process? Or are reps just kind of lazy and say, I put an opportunity, and when, the, when I get the contract back, I just close it. Could be sits in one stage and closes, and it takes six months, but nothing happened in between. So we've really uncovered a lot with uh, stage progression, and it, it's really worth looking at and, and comparing against your sales process and your sales cycle. So we'll begin, or we'll end, Bill, where we began. There was a question that an executive raised for you around the length of the average sales cycle. And at the time, it was a bit of a scramble to answer that question. Here now is a visualization that immediately gives you the answer to that question. For the deals in the current pipeline, on average, 190 days to close those deals. But to your point, each of the reps is going to exhibit different characteristics or tendencies. And by looking at individual reps and their performance within each stage of the sales process, you gain some very interesting insight. What you learn, for example, in this case is that Tom Jones tends to spend more time on discovery, but at the same time, if you look at the back end of the sales processes, he actually spends less time on proposing, proving, and negotiating. And maybe there's a correlation there. Maybe he does a better job of discovery which accelerates the deal on the back end. You see the opposite trend in someone like Jessica Owen, who moves very quickly through the early stages, but then tends to delay the deal as she gets into the later stages of the sales process. You don't get these kinds of nuances and insights if you're just looking at the macro level at your business, and if you don't have true visibility into sales stage progression. This is the kind of information that really helps a manager to sit down diagnose issues with individual team members, help to come up with recommendations, and then really see the acceleration on the back end of that. So Bill, we've, we've covered the four aspects of your pipeline management process. And maybe uh, before we move over to the questions, if you've got a couple of final thoughts in terms of some key takeaways. Yeah, there's a, you know, just a couple things. Um, any time you really get involved with something like this, the change management initiative is, is extremely critical to your success. And you really need to get your sales channels involved early on because they need to feel as though they, they have ownership in this whole thing. They need to feel part of the solution so it's easier for them to adopt in the future. And the technology, it's going to give you incredible insight. I mean, it's just, I, I, I honestly can say, that when we plugged in C9, we saw 
a whole new world and a whole new way of looking at the business and it allowed us to enable what we're talking about today. And the important thing is it's not going to happen overnight. It just stay your course because it's like I said early on, it's not an event, it's a journey. It's you plug in a CRM system, it's a journey. You plug in analytics, it's a journey. And you have to make sure you're bringing your channels along with you. And all of this that I talked about today can be leveraged by any company. If you have 10 reps or you're a big company with over 1,000 reps, as long as you create a philosophy, some very basic key metrics, and not a lot. We didn't talk about a lot today. And we, we've held these metrics the same for a whole year now, and, and we're going to continue into 2015 holding these metrics. And understanding the cadence is absolutely a key to your success. Excellent. Uh, well, Bill, thank you so much for sharing those insights. There's a lot of, of interest here, a lot of questions. I'll actually start off with two questions that are similar around predictive. And uh, the first question, and I'm, I'm happy to take this one, Bill, relates to can you explain the difference between traditional BI and project projections that a traditional BI system might make in a true predictive application? I think that's a great question there. There's a lot of noise right now in the marketplace around what is predictive analysis and how is it different. In my mind, predictive is the new big data term. Everybody seems to be adopting it and using it. But there are some real differences between what historically we've been able to do with BI versus what's happening today with predictive algorithms. With BI, you can obviously analyze trends. You can come up with ratios and factors that can be applied to a current state, for example, a pipeline. Um, Bill, you mentioned earlier, if you can calculate a coverage ratio or a, a yield percentage, you can apply that to the current pipeline and extrapolate where you'll land. And that is an analysis that a traditional BI solution could run. Where the nuances come with predictive are not looking at historical ratios and applying them to a current pipeline, but actually using machine learning to analyze an individual deal, assign a score to it based on whether or not that deal will close, and in addition to that, using machine learning to determine when the deal will close. There's no analysis that's done manually there. There are no pre-built equations. It's literally an algorithm that's coming up with closed probability as well as expected close date. And by using the algorithms to score that as opposed to manual calculations, you take a lot of the bias out of the system that goes into to building the, the traditional equations. So in my mind, that's the difference. It's using machine learning as opposed to manually generated calculations, um, removing the bias and coming up with a much more statistically significant result. In, in terms of the analysis. Uh, so Bill, a question for you that just came in. Uh, a lot of this relates to, the, a lot of the conversation we've had relates to process. Can you talk a little bit about the change management that went into getting the people in your organization to actually adopt the processes that you've rolled out? Yeah, so um, what we experienced, to tell you the truth, it started at the top, which was kind of unusual. And like I said before, every two weeks, our, our executive team adopted this, this philosophy and everything else. And then we actually trickled it down to our, our sales management team. And the, the, really the key to getting adoption was our frontline sales manager. And we believe me, we still have a long way to go. But uh, that sales manager is absolutely key to getting uh, involved and getting them speaking the cadence and getting your learning and development organization, if you have a training group, um, making sure that every time they're talking to a new hire, to a refresher class, they're always, always bringing this up in terms of cadence and embedding this into your organization. It's, uh, it's absolutely critical. But we were very, very fortunate that our executive team, to the person, adopted this mm -hmm. philosophy. Um, adopted the cadence when they would go out to the field and talk to the reps and the management team. 
and, uh, and right to our CEO. I mean, they are speaking the same language, and that is absolutely fantastic. It's, it's, that's a big deal for us, and it's probably a really big deal for most companies as well. So another question for you. It appears that your managers have a tremendous amount of information now that they didn't have previously. Can you speak to the way this has impacted the quality of the coaching that occurs during the management calls? Yeah, the, the coaching has improved dramatically. We've really seen um, uh, the, the coaching with, with, the, with the sales rep because now what we've done is introduced a way, a, a way to do it, an approach, and these four pieces, the pipeline analysis, starting with that, investigating change, pipeline risk, and progression, we've literally laid that out in C9 and removed all the other noise, and they literally, it says one, two, three, four, and they go through each one of these. They have a very consistent conversation. We've seen um, some of our sales cycles increase in some places. Our yields improve. We've had better visibility to pipeline, whereas the pipeline yields were very, very, uh, you know, varied over time. And every quarter we're seeing different improvements in these key metrics and even other other metrics that we measure internally to say, you know, what's our ROI on this investment? And we've, we've been very pleased with the direction it's gone. Perfect. And one final question before we end. There was a question around deployment of this kind of a solution, the time involved. I can share my perspective, and then it would be great. Bill, I know you had a massive deployment of C9 at Pitney. It would be great if you could uh, touch on that. But in terms of bringing C9 up, uh, very straightforward, we require the logging credentials of your CRM system. Uh, we self-configure based on the way that the CRM system has been configured. So literally in a day, you can start to see the kinds of analysis that we showed uh, during today's webinar up in front of you with your data. Obviously, though, there are some nuances based on customizations you've made to CRM or specific processes that you're trying to roll out and the um, uh, specific cadences that you're trying to embed in the tool. And that, that tends to be what makes for more of a protracted sales cycle. So, Bill, maybe if you want to describe the, the rollout process on your site at Pinty, that would be great, too. Yeah, so we, we had uh, a very prescriptive process that we used, and, and we went after the sales managers first. And we had training with all of our sales managers in teams across the globe, different languages, you know, you name it, we did it. And the key was really getting those managers engaged, have them understand the language, because it was brand new to them, right? So like I said earlier, I could take five sales reps and say, tell me what your process is or your definition of pipeline is, and they would all give me five different answers. So. First, it's that fundamental, let's get everybody in a room that are going to manage people and have them trained to these different metrics that we're talking about, the philosophy, and then getting them into the cadence. Once we finished with the, the sales managers, we trained the sales managers again with their sales reps. So that was really the key to their success because the manager could now participate in the training of the sales reps because they were already participating and they already learned before. And you want to do it very quickly. You don't want to you don't want too much time to go by because you want everybody to be working towards that same end game. And that was really uh, a way that we approached it. Sometimes we had to do it um, via web uh, because of distance, uh, and other times where we, we could. And I would recommend again to anybody if you can get people live, it is absolutely the best because. Uh, I don't know how many of you out there are multitasking right now, but uh, <laughs> um, you know, people will multitask when uh, when they have to do some distance learning. So if you can get them in front of you, it'll happen much, much, much faster. And look, uh, just because you do it once means you got to do it again and again and again. And as a matter of fact, um, today my team, along with learning and development, had what we called better by eights, which is uh, 8.30 this morning, we opened up a, uh, a WebEx to all of our uh, salespeople in one specific channel and just 
taught them a few things and then open it up for questions and answers and we do that on a regular basis and we did it twice today and then we'll do it you know in another few weeks with another channel so it's that constant reinforcement and being available to people it's very helpful we'd like to thank bill for his presentation today and for answering some of those questions and now we'd like to turn it over to chandra patel our senior director of marketing here at insightsales.com for any live q a that you'd like to ask now you can go ahead and start placing your questions in the q a box and i will pass it off to chandra great thank you um, first of all, I hope you enjoyed that rebroadcast of Bill's session. Um, I see a couple questions trickling in here, uh, and I want to answer this first one because it comes up a lot from folks that are beginning to use uh, the C9 products or they're considering using it. Uh, the question is, I don't have the best data in my CRM system. Is that going to hurt? Uh, my ability to use uh, the pipeline tool. Um, first of all, as I said, we hear this a lot, and there are two things that we that really consistently come up. Um, pretty much everybody doesn't have great data to begin with because you're putting information into the CRM or into your Salesforce instance, but you're not really sure what you're getting out. Uh, I've heard customers say, uh, HD Forecast actually allows me to shine a flashlight into the dark corners of Salesforce. Now I know what what information is actually there or not there. Um, and it actually helps you know where you should prioritize cleaning up the data. Uh, so, for example, you can see, and Bill talked about uh, use cases, um, where the reps actually have... Um, you know, how long has it been in any one stage? So if there's been an opportunity, been sitting in one stage for 200 days, that's a place where you want to clean up whether or not the opportunity should be moved forward or if it actually um, should be deleted or uh, closed out because it's no longer active. Uh, the next question is, how do reps actually feel about this process. Bill mentioned a lot about the sales manager and how it's, it's translated uh, very well for their business. Um, reps actually love these tools uh, twofold. One, they're working off of the same information as their manager. Um, it, it's a system of truth. Uh, because of that, uh, they actually don't have to spend as much time uh, preparing for their pipeline call. Uh, that actually increases the amount of time they have to sell and that when they're working with their manager, they're saying, okay, here are the three opportunities uh, we want to talk about. The manager can actually be very grounded and give practical coaching tips that helps reps be more successful in their jobs. Okay. Um, so there's a question here, and it's about specific tools that Inside Sales recommends for a sales team. Um, where you actually can't control the buying cycle. Um, you know, I actually want to highlight the predictive capabilities of HD Forecast and Sales Advisor in respect to that. Um, because what it does, and we didn't talk about it, and Bill didn't talk about it in depth on this webinar, uh, but it actually highlights the likelihood that the opportunity would be won and that's based on machine learning and all the attributes, hundreds of attributes that are relevant to the opportunity. And when it will be won, that's a critical question here. So what quarter is it? If you could have an opportunity that is likely to win, but maybe not this quarter. So in situations where you don't have a lot of control over the buying cycle, this is, this is again a moment of truth. So instead of having your sales rep chase down this opportunity immediately, you can focus them on an opportunity that you are more likely to pull into the quarter. Uh, you can be very um, strategic and thoughtful about where you spend your time. And that relates directly to 
what revenue is likely to come in. So I hope that answered your question, Alex. Uh, we'd love to talk to you more about this. I uh, know it's almost the top of the hour, and I'm sure you all have to get back to work. We appreciate the time that you've taken to spend with us and look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye.